Thank you for having me. And I do, as Jenny said, I want to talk to you today about the work that I've been doing over the past five years as a journalist, uh, interviewing teenage girls about their attitudes and expectations and experience with sexuality. And I'm going to talk about how I came to the work and hopefully in describing the landscape that they are inhabiting now, help inspire your own thinking about how to integrate the discussion about sexuality and relationships with your- <laughs> It's totally okay. Everybody said that, you know? It's okay to feel, you know, grossly like you just want to lay down. Like, why on the floor? Just do it anyway. Just do it. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be here for signing the books outside, so you can meet her outside and she'll sign your book. And please drop off the service for us as well. Kids in ways that are ethical and compassionate. And, you know, Jenny said, I, I know she's putting it in a Catholic context, but I think it rings true for all of us, um, treating one another with dignity and respect and ethics and compassion. Um, so, I've been writing about girls for over 20 years now, and in the book that I wrote directly before Girls and Sex, Cinderella Ate My Daughter, I talked about the ways that the pink and pretty culture of little girlhood um, taught girls. I started calling it the princess industrial complex, after all. And it taught girls from the earliest ages that how they looked was more important than who they were. And I'm also the mom, at the time I was the mom of a three-year-old, now I'm the mom of a 13-year-old, and I started hearing a lot of stories from friends with older kids about binge drinking and sexting and hookup culture, and my reaction to those stories, honestly, was to just um, plug my ears and say, don't tell me, don't tell me, because I really believe that parenting from ignorance and fear is a good strategy. <laughs> And finally, we were having this umbrella conversation in the culture about sexual assault on campus. And that is such an important discussion that we're engaging in in public now. And, you know, it's absolutely crucial that young people understand the ground rules for consent. At the same time, I felt that that was where the discussion was ending. And in the vacuum of information surrounding that, the media and the internet which is basically today's digital street corner, we're educating our kids for us. And I realized that if we really wanted kids to engage ethically and reciprocally and responsibly and enjoyably, that we had to have more open, honest discussion about sexuality and about what happens after yes. So in thinking about all that, I began delving into decades of research on girls and sexuality. And most of the research, um, the, it's really dominated by research into pregnancy and disease prevention. And there's very little, though more than there used to be, about the quality of girls' experience, about their motivation, um, and about developing a healthy sense of their own sexuality. So I was trying to look at all of that, and I was also going around the country and interviewing girls and the girls, that what I wanted to know from them was, did they have more freedom than my generation to shape their experiences? Did they have more influence? Did they have more control within those encounters? Were they less subject to stigma? Were they more able to experience joy? And so all in all, I did about 70 interviews, in-depth interviews with girls ages 15 to 20. And the kids that I talked to sp sp spanned a pretty broad range ethnically. Um, but they were largely in the kind of broad swath of the middle class. And I chose that demographic on purpose. They were all either in college or college bound um, because I wanted to talk to girls that we think of as having opportunity and the girls that we think of as being, you know, the real big beneficiaries of the feminist movement. Because I felt like even those girls who were so ambitious and so directed and so thoughtful and forthright, you know, leaning in all over the place, I'm in Atherton, so I have to say that right. Um, if even they were toppling in their personal lives, then it would be hard to deny that there was an issue. 
So one of the things that became really clear to me early on was that this generation of women did feel entitled to engage in sexual behavior, but they didn't necessarily feel entitled to enjoy it. So for instance, I was talking to a sophomore in Ivy League school who was from the Bay Area, and she said to me, I come from generations of smart, strong women. My grandmother is a firecracker, my mom is professional, my sister and I are loud, and that's our form of feminine power. And then she then proceeded to describe her sex life to me, which was a series of one-offs that had started when she was about 13 years old that were not especially respectful, not especially responsible, and not especially enjoyable. And she said, you know, I guess we girls are just these docile creatures who are socialized not to express our wants and needs. And I said, wait a minute, didn't you just tell me a minute ago what a smart, strong woman you are? And she kind of hemmed and hawed, and finally she said, yeah, I guess nobody ever told me that that smart, strong image also applied to sex. So there was this disconnect, and there was another disconnect too, that was that girls were presenting themselves in public in ever more revealing and provocative clothing, presenting themselves in sexier ways, which was making their parents tear their hair out. But there was a disconnect too between that sexy presentation, which the culture was demanding of them, and a kind of ignorance about and discomfort with their actual bodies. So earlier I mentioned that um, Cinderella, my daughter, in my previous book, taught girls that how they look was more important than who they were. And that it was urging them to seek validation from the outside in rather than from the inside out. As they get older, they start learning that being desirable is more important than understanding their own desire. And that pink and pretty innocence turns to the imperative to be hot, which is like the big buzzword of our time. And hot is different than attractive or beautiful. It's a very commercialized, commodified, narrow idea of sexiness that Boyle Ariel Levy, who's a journalist who wrote Female Show Miss Pig, boils it down to two words, and I'm going to go, go blue here, go profane here, so prepare yourselves. Um, hot really boils down to two words, which is fuckable and sellable. And whereas women who were young in, you know, who are Gen X people and baby boom women might have pushed back against that notion as being, um, imposing self objectification onto us as girls back in those days. For today's girls, it's much more complicated. And they're sold this idea as being not only the source of self-empowerment, but kind of the ultimate source of self-empowerment. And so there, it's, you know, it's personal power, it's confidence, it's self-expression. And girls would talk to me about their pop icons like Beyonce, Gaga, Miley, and Nikki. Um, we would argue about it. You know, were they taking control of their sexuality or were they exploiting their sexuality? Take the, um, I'm sure you all follow every move that Kim Kardashian makes, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I have to, it's my job. Um, <laughs> on International Women's Day, she, said, she Instagrammed a photo um, of herself, a nude selfie, with uh, the caption, when you don't have anything, when you don't know what to wear, LOL, and the hashtag, Happy International Women's Day. And older women, you know, were not happy, and they scolded Kim um, for uh, um, exploiting herself. And younger girls immediately shot back and said Kim was just expressing her sexuality and that she was um, a self-empowered woman who chose to do what she did. And so I think the lens that is missing and something that we can bring to our kids in talking about this is this wonderful idea that I came along along the way, which is the patriarchal bargain. And a patriarchal bargain is a decision by a woman to accept the gender rules and roles that typically disadvantage women in exchange for the power that she's able to get from taking on those roles. So it's an individual strategy that benefits the individual while leaving the system intact. So Kim gets a lot of fame and money for selling her sex appeal. She also has to accept the downsides, like that, you know, her sell by date is, I think, last week. Um, but she doesn't change the system that requires female celebrities, whether they're actors, singers, athletes, newscasters, to be hot in order to get ahead. So it's just another way of, of framing, you know, why 
She is neither feminist icon nor, you know, whatever else you want to call her. Um, and while young women, where this relates to their own lives, is while they don't necessarily have a million dollar empire to promote, they can relate to that imperative to trade on their sex appeal um, and their physical assets to gain popularity because, you know, every girl you talk to knows that you get more likes when you put a picture of yourself up in a bikini than when you put a picture of yourself up on, in an anorak. So girls would talk about simultaneously feeling free to choose a sexualized image, which was really nobody's damn business but their own, and feeling like they had no other choice. So one of the girls that I spoke with showed me a picture of herself going out for a party. She was a college sophomore, and she was wearing um, a crop top and a, a little skirt and, and high heels. And she said, and this was a really typical line that girls would use, I'm proud of my body, I like to show it off, and I never feel more liberated than when I wear skimpy clothes. And you know, as a feminist adult, that would kind of make my mind just seize up a little bit, and I think, well, what does that mean? And so we talked about it a little further, and as we discussed it, she said that a year earlier, she wouldn't have worn that same outfit because she was 25 pounds heavier. And as she put it, you know, some jerky guy at the party might have called me the fat girl, and that would have been bad for my mental health. And setting aside, you know, why the phrase fat girl should make her melt like the Wicked Witch of the West in the brown sugar puddle, um, it's understandable that you'd feel good about showing off the right body. And it's affirming, certainly, to attract male attention, and it's even affirming to attract female envy. But it's worth discussing with girls who gets to be proud of which body, under what circumstances, and how liberating is it really if the threat of humiliation lurks right around the corner. So it catches girls in this double bind, where on one hand the culture pushes them to present as sexy from the youngest ages, and then the adults who say that that was so very cute when they were four tell them that, you know, they're dressing like hookers when they're 14. And I get it. Believe me, I do. I've got a 13-year-old, and I get the, the dilemma. Um, that we're all faced with as parents, and the issues of dress codes and wardrobes, and it's a, it's a constant balance. But I feel that rather than demonizing girls in, on an individual level, what is useful to them, and making hot, you know, what, what that ends up doing is making hotness into their rebellion, and hotness becomes their feminist act, and that's really twisted. So instead, engaging them in discussion and critique of why the culture is selling this ideal to them, and the ways that it forces them to try to claim agency in a box whose boundaries they never agreed to, that they didn't draw, and what the impact of self-objectification is on young women. So there was a review of decades of research by the American so Psychological Association that found that self-objectification negatively affects mental health, body image, it's linked to depression, it's linked to eating disorders, it's linked to anxiety, and it's also linked to reduced cognitive skills. So my very favorite um, study that I like to share with teenagers is one that was called uh, that, th that Swimsuit Becomes You. And the researchers took um, a, a group of students from a high school, a college calculus class, excuse me, and they put them all in dressing rooms in a mall. And they had half the female students and half the male students try on sweaters. And they had the other half of the female students, the other half of the male students, try on bathing suits. And then they gave them a math test. And I know, who thinks of these things? And, and the girls, it was a one-piece suit, it wasn't a bikini, and they also had heaters, so nobody could blame it on them being cold. And lo and behold, the young women's scores were depressed in relationship to the scores of the women who wore sweaters, and there was no such difference in the male scores. So there was something about having, whether it was stereotype activation or having cognitive resources drained towards body monitoring or having that consciousness of their body activated that directly affected their academic performance on the spot. And that's, you know, that's, that's pretty profound. And self-objectification is even associated with reduced political efficacy, the sense that girls can create change in the world. So um, at Princeton University, they were finding uh, in 2012 that um, few, they looked back a decade and found that fewer young women were going out for leadership positions in the school. 
and they wanted to know why. So they did a series of interviews with young women and they found that um, a big reason was they felt not just that they had to be qualified, but they had to do everything. They had to do it well and they had to be hot when they did it. And it was that last piece that often kept them from being able to step forward, the fear of not looking the part. At Duke, they had a similar thing, they called it effortless perfection, and there have subsequently been studies at a number of campuses where girls have struggled with these issues. And in a real bait and switch, self-objectification is also linked to reduced sexual satisfaction. And yet, that performance of sexiness has not just been conflated with sexuality for girls, it's often replaced it. So the culture is littered with female body parts. You know, they're used to sell everything from hamburgers to hit single, singles. And if all of that led to more agency for girls, more voice, more pleasure, more power in their sexual encounters, I would say, okay, I'm old, I'm fusty, I need to get off the stage, I need to find another job. But that's not what's happening. Instead, that purported confidence is coming off with their clothes. And really, you have to ask, who cares about how great your body looks if you don't enjoy its responses? So Sarah McLellan, who's a psychologist at the University of Michigan, coined what is my absolute favorite organizing principle in thinking about these issues. And it's this notion of intimate justice. And intimate justice is the idea that sex has political implications as well as personal ones, just like who does the dishes in your home? Or, or who vacuums the rug? And it brings up similar uh, ideas about inequality, economic disparity, violence, physical and mental well-being. Intimate justice asks us to consider who is entitled to engage in an experience? Who is entitled to enjoy it? Who is the primary beneficiary? And how does each partner define good enough? And honestly, I think that those can be difficult and sometimes traumatic questions for adult women to confront. But I think that when we're talking about girls, I just always come back to this idea that their early experiences shouldn't be something that they have to get over. So I should probably say right here that kids are not having sex at younger ages, nor are they having a higher rate of, of uh, sex at higher rates than they did 20 years ago. And that's something important not just for parents to know, but for young people to know, because as we'll see later, they tend to overestimate what other people are doing. Everyone is not, in fact, doing it. At least when we define sex as intercourse. But that's a little bit problematic, because kids are engaging in other behaviors more. And when we ignore that, when we allow them to label those behaviors as not sex, then that opens the door to risk and disrespect. And that's particularly true of oral sex. The rise of oral sex and the idea that it was less intimate than intercourse was the biggest change in American sexual behavior in the 20th century. And the girls would tell me frequently, it's no big deal. That was always, it was like they all read the same instruction manual. They all used the same phrase. And it, it, but it, that was only true if boys were on the receiving end. And they had a lot of reasons for participating. It, it was a way to improve a relationship. Um, it boosted social status. It made them feel desired. It was a way to avoid the emotional intimacy they associated with intercourse or what girls, uh, what, uh, not just girls, was what's called catching feelings, like it's a disease. Um, and sometimes it was a way for them to get out of an uncomfortable situation. So a freshman at a West Coast college said to me, a girl will, uh, will give a guy a blowjob at the end of the night because she doesn't want to sleep with him and he expects to be satisfied. So if I want him to leave and I don't want anything to happen, you know, there's just so much to unpack in that statement of why she thinks that's nothing happening, why the boy expects to be satisfied, you know, the, the, the veiled threat of assault with a bit of self-blame on the side. And I heard so many stories, okay, and I've taken it before I did this again, so. Hmm. which is going to be particularly relevant when I tell you my next anecdote. Um, I heard so many stories of girls performing one-sided oral sex that I started asking them, what if every time you were alone with a guy, he told you to get him a glass of water from the kitchen, and he never got you a glass of water? 
Or if he did, it was like, do you want me to, uh, you know, it, like really begrudging? You wouldn't stand for it. And they would laugh, and they would say, well, when you put it like that, I said, why wouldn't you put it like that? Why would you think that getting somebody a glass of water is less insulting than performing a sex act? And I think that part of it was not just that boys were unwilling, because they weren't always unwilling. It was that girls didn't want it. And that young women had internalized and expressed a sense of shame and anxiety around their genitals. And a sense that, I guess, they, the way that they would put it is they were simultaneously icky and sacred. So women's feelings about their genitals have been directly linked to their enjoyment of sex. But according to uh, Debbie Herbenek, who is a researcher at Indiana University, girls' genital self-image is under siege, with more pressure than ever to see their vulvas as unacceptable in their natural state. And by that, she particularly meant the new expectations around pubic hair. About three quarters of college women uh, remove their pubic hair, all of it, at least on occasion, and more than half do so regularly. Uh, most of the high school girls that I talked to did as well. And they would tell me that pubic hair removal was um, something that they did for themselves, a personal choice, though it was really hard for me to believe that left alone on a desert island, that this was how they were shoes. They don't think it's funny when I uh, and when I pressed further, a darker motivation would, would often emerge, which was avoiding humiliation. So as, as one high school girl said to me, guys act like they'd be disgusted by it. And nobody wants to be talked about like that. The rise in pubic hair removal reminded me of um, how women first started shaving their legs and armpits in the 1920s. That was when flapper fashions first came in, and women's limbs first became visible and open to public scrutiny. And I think there's a way that this, too, indicates that the most intimate part of a girl's body is now open to public scrutiny, and open to critique, and open to becoming, again, more about how it looks to others than how it looks to them. One kind of um, fun antidote to this is uh, if you look on, online, um, there's an art project called The Great Wall of Vagina, which I was talking about earlier today at the faculty. I'd forgotten about it until suddenly remembered it again. That uh, this artist did plaster casts of something like 400 women's vulvas and then just made a wall out of them. And you can find it online. And what I think is great about it for girls is that they have such an, a, a fear about not looking right, about not looking normal, about whether they're ugly, about what this means, that just saying, whoa, you know, it's like a fingerprint, I, I think is actually kind of a useful um, thing for them to see. But the trend in all this, I mean, this is something that was a real surprise to me and I think is a real generational divide for the most part. Um, and it, it comes directly from porn. And it began as a trick to get a better camera shot. And honestly, I could devote this whole discussion tonight to the impact of porn in the internet age. But I think I will just say, suffice to say, that internet porn has been a game changer for young people. And what it means is that they're being exposed to pornography in middle school, either accidentally or because somebody you know, shows them their smartphone. And that it's something that's really, really important for us parents to get out front on and address with them. And if you are thinking about porn and you're thinking about, you know, the magazines that you used to stuff under your mattress in high school or something, or your brothers did, you need to go actually on a site like Pornhub.com and see what kids can get for free, what, what young kids are looking at for free. If you're 40, you go do whatever you want to do. But, I think it's really important for us to know what kids are looking at because what we find is there was a survey of college students in the UK that found that 60%, and I found this with kids here all the time, said that they consulted porn in part as sex education. When they're not getting it home, particularly when they're not getting it at school, and you can get it at the click of the mouse, that's where they look. And that was true even though 75% of them knew that it was about as realistic as pro wrestling. Curiosity about sex, totally natural. Totally natural. And if it was there, you know, we'd probably, you know, when we were that age, we'd probably be clicking on it too. But like I said, the average age of first exposure to porn now is 11. And we have to ask, 
how it affects young people to be exposed to anything that they can imagine and a lot of things that nobody wants to imagine when they haven't even held hands or had their first kiss yet. And what it means to learn about sex from yet another realm that prizes the hot, yet another realm where um, women are, both men's and women's bodies are distorted and where women's sexuality is presented as in service of men and in which humiliation of women is often eroticized. So, porn teaches us that sex is supposed to be hot, but it doesn't teach that sex is supposed to be warm. And what I mean by that isn't even loving, but compassionate, you know, there's no, there's no uh, kindness there. There's no recognizing the humanity of your partner. There's no acknowledging um, that person's well-being or, 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 or kindness there. And so later, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about how that sort of transfers over to um, the hookup culture and the ways that kids don't have a model of treating their partners in ethical, respectful, responsible, compassionate ways if they're not in a relationship or when they're not in a relationship. But at any rate, that's not part of the equation, and it's not part of the fantasy. And again, that has um, implications when we think of those questions of intimate justice. The media has been called a super peer, and it dictates kids' cultural scripts, including their sexual scripts. And porn is now no question influencing that. So girls would talk to me about the ways that porn scripts was coming into their bedroom. One of the, at the more G-rated end of the spectrum, they would say to me, um, my boyfriend wants to know why I don't make those noises like porn stars make when we have sex. And that, there were just certain things that would make, you know, I'm a journalist, I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to be like a therapist, kind of, you know, like objective. And it would just go, and I just, I couldn't stay silent. I'd say, you know, it's a movie, right? And in movies, they have to have soundtracks or else it's a silent movie. <laughs> so if they didn't make those noises, it would be a silent movie. And they would sort of go, I never thought about it that way. Um, but the truth is, is that you don't have to look at porn to be influenced by its scripts and, or, or, or even to you know, learn a sense of unreality around sex. I was, um, a while back I, I had a conversation with my daughter, there was a billboard up in Berkeley that said porn kills love, I, I'm not really sure who put that there. And so we started talking about it, she really enjoyed that. And, uh, <laughs> You can imagine what it's like to be my kid. Um, and then we went home that night and we watched the movie Brooklyn, which is, did you see Brooklyn? It's a really good movie, really lovely movie. But it has a kind of sex scene in it that kids will see like 379,562 times um, or so during their adolescence, in which um, people, you know, kiss for three seconds, and then they rip each other's clothes off, and then they have apparently intercourse in a, the missionary position for two more seconds, and then everybody's happy. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's as unrealistic and probably damaging to their vision of what it's like as anything. And I said, you know, honey, you know how when you're watching a movie and they show a cab ride, they show a person getting into the cab, and then they get to their, they show them getting out of the cab at their destination, but they don't show the whole cab ride in between. You know, that's what they do with sex. It would take too long. That's what they do with sex. So they show these symbols to tell you that sex has occurred. And they're from a very particular point of view as well, a very kind of, you know, male centered, centered point of view. This is not really what sex is, any more than the violence you see on TV or in movies is really what violence is like in real life. And you need to really understand that, and that kind of engendered um, a, 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 a whole much longer conversation together. So it's, it's interrupting and discussing not just these things at the far end, like porn, but the things that they're sort of seeing every day. The other thing that has been on the rise among high school students at the more kind of triple X end of the spectrum, and college students as well, um, as a direct result of the ubiquity of porn, is anal sex. And in 1992, 16% of young women ages 18 to 24 said that they had tried anal sex. Today, according to the largest study on American sexual behavior, 20% of young women 18 to 19 have, and by 20 to 24, it's 40%. And I'm not saying this to demonize any particular behavior, but 
I think it's important to look at young people's motivations and the quality of their experience when they're engaging in these behaviors. So a 2014 study of 16 to 18 year old heterosexuals um, in the British Medical Journal found that it was mainly boys who were pushing for this. And they were approaching it not as a form of intimacy with a partner, but as a competition with other boys, as something to you know, knock off their bucket list. And they expected girls to endure the act, and they believed that the girls would need to be and could be coerced into it. The young women, no surprise, consistently reported the practice was painful, and both sexes blamed the girls for that. Both the boys and the girls blamed the girls. And they said that the girls were naive or flawed or inexperienced or unable to relax, and that was why that had happened. When anal sex is included, 70% um, of, of young women report pain in their uh, sexual encounters. And even when it's not, about a third of young women say that they experience pain, as opposed to 5% of, of men, young men. So for all these reasons, when we talk about sexual satisfaction, sexual satisfaction is a gendered concept. We think we're all talking about the same thing, but we're not. And again, you know, that goes back to this intimate justice idea. How does each partner define good enough? Well, in research of college uh, students, young women are more likely than young men to use their partner's pleasure as the measure of their satisfaction. So they'll say, if he was satisfied, then I'm satisfied. Young men are more likely than young women to measure their satisfaction by their own orgasm. Conversely, when they talk about bad sex, that too is gendered. Young women in the research use terms like humiliating, degrading, depressing, painful. Not a single young man in the research used that language. So when young women report sexual satisfaction levels equal to or greater to young men's, which they often do in the research, that can be deceptive. Because if a girl is going into an experience hoping that it won't hurt, wanting to feel close to a partner, and expecting him to have an orgasm, she'll be satisfied if those criteria are met. And there's obviously nothing wrong with wanting to feel close to a partner and wanting him to be happy, and orgasm isn't the only measure of satisfaction, though women are six times more likely to say they enjoyed an encounter when they do have one. But absence of pain, you know, it's just a very low bar for a sexual experience. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that we could perform a kind of psychological clitoridectomy on American girls. And what I mean by that is, from the time kids are infants, the parents of baby boys are much more likely to name all their body parts. So they'll at least say, here's your pee-pee, they'll say something. Whereas the parents of girls are more likely to go right from navel to knee and leave this whole situation, you know, kind of unnamed. And there is no better way to make something unspeakable than not to name it. Then kids, if they have it, go into their puberty education classes, and they learn that boys have erections and ejaculations, and girls have periods and unwanted pregnancy. And they see that internal um, diagram, you know, the, the thing that looks like a steer head of the women's reproductive <laughs> And, and it grays out between the legs always, right? So we never say vulva, we certainly never say clitoris. Um, no surprise, fewer than half of girls aged 14 to 17 have ever masturbated, which means the only time they're going down there for themselves is to remove their pubic hair. Um, and then they go to their partner encounters. And we think that somehow they're going to believe that sex is about them, that they're going to believe that they have a voice, that they're going to magically be able to express their wants, their needs, their desires, or their limits, or even know what those might be. You know, it's completely unrealistic. We've set them up. And it's almost as if, as adults, we believe that if we don't tell girls that sex should feel really great to them, that they won't find out, and then they won't do it. But in fact, the research is really clear that the opposite is true that the more information, the more self-knowledge, the more understanding and joy that they feel in their own bodies, the more ownership they feel in their own bodies, encourages them, encourages them excuse me, to hold a higher standard for their experience, 
whether they are in a relationship or whether they're not. Now, interestingly, girls retain that investment in their partner's pleasure, regardless of the gender of their partner. So, in same-sex encounters, young women's climax, young women climax at precisely the same rate as men in heterosexual encounters. The lesbian and bisexual girls that I talked to would talk about feeling liberated to get off the script. And again, I don't know, maybe kids, because they're all looking at the internet, they all use the same phrases no matter where they live, but that's what they, they were saying, I, I really like getting off the script. And that they felt free to create an encounter creatively that really worked for them. Gay girls also challenged the idea of virginity as defined by first intercourse. And I'm not saying, trying to say here, I want to be clear, I'm not saying intercourse isn't a big deal. But it's worth questioning how it serves girls to tell them that this one act, which most of them associate with discomfort or, or pain, is so much more meaningful and transformative than anything else. And that it's this line in the sand between childhood and adulthood. And it's worth asking whether that is keeping them safer from disease, from coercion, from betrayal, from assault, whether it's giving them more control over their experience, whether it's giving them more understanding, whether it's encouraging mutuality and caring with partners, whether it's affect, how it's affecting their perception as other kinds of sexual acts, and again, what it means for gay teens who can have multiple sex partners without ever engaging in heterosexual intercourse. So I asked one of the gay girls that I met, how'd you know you weren't a virgin anymore? She said, yeah, I had to Google that. <laughs> and, and Google didn't know. Google was not sure. <laughs> Failed her. So I said, how'd you decide? And she said, well, you know, she thought about it. She said, you know when I think I wasn't a virgin anymore? I think it was the first time I had an orgasm with a partner. And I thought, whoa. What if just for a second we imagined that that was the definition? how that would affect and shift our whole approach to talking about sexuality. And again, not because intercourse isn't a big deal, of course it is, but it's not the only big deal. And rather than conceptualizing sex as a race to a goal, where none of this other stuff really matters or counts, it reframes the idea of sex as a pool of experiences that includes affection and warmth and closeness and touch, and desire, and arousal, and intimacy, and all of these things. And it's worth, when we talk to our kids, saying, you know, let's think about it, who's really the more sexually experienced person? Is it the person who made out with a partner for three hours, and experimented with sexual tension, and eroticism, and, and communication? Or the person who gets wasted at a party, and hooks up with a random, because they feel like they have to get rid of their virginity before they go to college? So, speaking of hooking up, we talk about hooking up a lot these days. Does anybody know what that means? Anybody have a definition for hooking up? I'll take a drink of water, you can think about it. Well, the truth is it doesn't mean anything. Or it could mean anything. It might mean um, kissing. It might mean oral sex or manual sex. It might mean vaginal intercourse. And the truth is, in college, about a third of hookups fall into each one of those categories. But because of that ambiguity, as I said earlier, kids vastly overestimate what their peers are doing. And the reality is, while one in five kids does hook up ten times or more in college by their senior year, one in four seniors in college in the largest study ever conducted have never hooked up. Not once. And among the rest, the average number is seven. And again, when hookup is defined so broadly, it's not exactly the follow from. What's more, in one survey of college students, 70% of both sexes believed that their classmates were only interested in hookups. But 75% said that they themselves would prefer to go on a date and get to know somebody than hook up. And 80% said that they hoped to be in a loving relationship within a year. So there was a disconnect between what they believed about other people and what they actually felt themselves. And I think that knowing that for young people, knowing that 
um, what they're being told and sort of the hype around what they're being told may not actually be the truth and statistically in, in large-scale research has proven not to be the truth can relieve them of a lot of anxiety and relieve them a lot of pressure of feeling that they have to engage in certain behaviors. So meanwhile, it's, you know, today's generation did not invent casual sex, right? Um, so it's not hookups themselves that are new, the name is new, but it's, it's the concept of hookup culture. And hookup culture is the idea that casual sex no longer is an exception, but it's a norm, and it's the expected precursor rather than the product of intimacy. So dating and emotional intimacy are the last step instead of the first step. And hooking up has become normalized, particularly among college students, but increasingly among high school students, as the path to a relationship, even though most hookups don't actually result in relationships, so it's a little bit of a contradiction. So kids, again, in college and, and increasingly in high school, and certainly in the Bay Area, um, have had to define themselves in relationship to that norm, whether they're going to opt in or whether they're going to opt out. So as kids tour their college campuses, you know, it's, a, it's part of the question that you should have for the campus is, you know, is this a hookup culture? What kind of party scene is it? Um, what does it mean about social life? What does it mean about drinking? Because hookup culture, among other things, is a heavy drinking culture. And hookups are not just lubricated by alcohol, they are actually dependent upon alcohol. Sober sex would be the all-purpose word, awkward. <laughs> Drunkenness is what signals that sex is meaningless to kids. They would sometimes talk about sober sex like it was this amazing unicorn, you know, that one would have. 89% of college students get drunk before they hook up with a stranger, and 75% before they hook up with an acquaintance, and the average number of drinks is um, six that they have. So Lisa Wade, who's a sociologist in Occidental in, in Southern California, says that alcohol creates what she called compulsory carelessness that's necessary for a hookup. What that means is that in a hookup, you're not supposed to be caring. You're not supposed to choose your partner with care. You're not supposed to think carefully about whether you even want to be doing this. And you're not supposed to care for your partner, for their feelings, for their well-being, and in guys, um, from guys' perspectives, for girls' sexual satisfaction. 17% uh, of girls report orgasms in first-time hookups as opposed to 60% of boys, and again, not the only measure of an experience, but when girls are six times more likely to say that they enjoyed an encounter when it happens. So in hookup culture, there should also be no expectation of contact the following day. No expectation of a text, again, seeming a pretty low bar. Uh, and that carelessness means you're really supposed to prove that you care less. And girls would tell me, because of that, the first person who did text or make contact loses. I think for girls, too, that alcohol does something else. I think it's a release from a certain kind of accountability. One girl said to me, a high school girl, you know, usually the opposite of a negative is a positive, but when you're talking about girls and sex, it's two negatives. You're either a prude or you're a slut. And when you're trying to find a place to stand, to balance, on what is an ever-shifting terrain between those two poles of negativity, Alcohol offers you a way out. You weren't being approved, you weren't being a, a, a slut. You were just, oops, drunk, and that's what happens. So all that said, some of the girls I talked to wanted to talk to me specifically because they liked hookups. They were not victims of this culture, they were participants in it, active participants. They said they were too busy for a relationship, they wanted to focus on their studies, they had jobs, they had internships, they wanted to hang out with their friends, they didn't want to have a boyfriend, they didn't want to take care of somebody's emotional needs, but they wanted to have an active sex life, they were in college. So my job in writing about hookup culture was not to tell young women or men to dictate the context, I was not trying to dictate the context in which they ought to have sex, that was not my role. But I did want to illuminate in a non-judgmental way what they were likely to get and not get out of those situations. So in a hookup, young women were likely to get a feeling of being desired or wanted. They were likely to get a conquest, an uh, adrenaline rush, a warm body, a war story the next day that they could tell their, their friends in the morning after recap. 
what they were less likely to get was good sex or the tools that they would need in order to create good sex or create intimacy. And I wanted them to have that information to demystify the worlds that they were living in and to understand, to contextualize, so they can make their choices and they can also understand the outcomes of those choices better and they can understand why they have a hookup and it seems kind of depressing the next day but they don't know why so they go out and do it again. Well, you know, that's, there's a reason for that. And I also wanted to go back to that idea that sex is supposed to be hot but not warm. And in the hookup culture, that is what it's like. Sex is supposed to be hot, but it's supposed to be less caring. It's supposed to be less warm. And to challenge people if they're going to be in those hookup cultures, to think about how they can do so with benevolence. Think about how they can do so with compassion and kindness. And are there ways to humanize your partner and regardless of whether you've known that person for 20 minutes or for 20 years. Because really, you know, treating each other like dirt is a very low road to equality. You can't really discuss the hookup culture without discussing issues of campus assault. And I really didn't want my work to be taken over by that discussion. But it's still so important to point out the ways that the very thing that's offered up as fun to young people, this party culture, the drunken hookup scene, also abets assault. And particularly once they're in college, um, and particularly on campuses with a strong Greek life, where party culture is particularly intense, it's guys who host the parties because sororities are all, nationally, are all dry. So boys control the turf, boys are buying the alcohol, Boys control the transportation. Girls are expected to wear skimpy clothing. They're often intentionally younger than their hosts. They're freshmen or early sophomores. Um, they're supposed to be polite, even when somebody is physically or verbally out of line, grabbing them and such. Fun girls are expected to drink a lot, and the good stuff is always kept in a private area. Alcohol loosens inhibitions. It anesthetizes against accountability. It obscures judgment. It also undermines the ability to, resi to resist. And alcohol is the number one date rape, date rape drug say, in this country. So party hookup culture can be easily manipulated by some to at best excuse coercion and at worst facilitate assault. We tend to focus on the impact of alcohol on girls in this discussion, and that's important. But I think we also have to recognize that for boys, alcohol has been shown to reduce their ability to read social cues, to give license to young men to ignore no that they otherwise might not, might not feel, to make them more aggressive when they do assault, and also it makes boys less likely to step in as bystanders when they see something going on than they would be if they were sober. So it's not just an issue to discuss with our daughters, it's a really important issue to discuss with our sons. About a quarter of the girls that I talked to had been assaulted. And those stories were really hard to hear, and a lot of them had happened in high school. Fully half of them, though, talked about coercion. And their stories were equally difficult to hear. And the truth is, again, in this vacuum, when we're not talking to our kids, the media and, and the way that they learn about sex from their friends, from wherever, bakes coercion into the process. It normalizes it. I noticed actually that um, the kids are doing Grease here, right? And I had watched, um, and I know that the, the cast has talked about this, but this is a great opportunity for, uh, for parents whose kids aren't in the cast to bring this issue up in a way, in a, in a context that is so mundane, the, the high school musical. But in Greece, there's a song called Summer Nights. And I don't know if you remember the, the, the musical, but the, the girls and the boys are singing, of course, and the girls sing, uh, they say, tell me more, tell me more, was it love at first sight? And the boys sing, tell me more, tell me more, did she put up a fight? And I, I heard that recently, because they were doing it live on Fox TV, and I, happened to, and I just thought, what? Man, I totally don't remember that. And then there's a scene in the, in the drive-in where Danny basically tries to assault Sandy and she runs away and then he sings a song alone at the drive-in about how ripped off he is. 
and how nasty Sandy is for not having let him attack her. And I know that in this, right? I mean, it's just stuff that you don't even think about. But that's the kind of thing, it, it gives such a, such a great opportunity because I know from talking to the kids today that the kids in the cast talked about this extensively. And they talked about if there was any other option in the play, whether they could change it, they decided they couldn't, all these different things. But they've talked about it. I don't know if the kids who are watching in the audience have talked about it. And it's a great opportunity if you come and see it as parents with your kids to say afterwards, like, whoa, well, did you notice that? That was really creepy. What was that about? You know, what do you think about that? Do you think that's still going on? It's fantastic that we've come so far that the kids in the cast are recognizing that as really inappropriate. But it's still there. And it does offer us a better. So I, so I invite you to use that as one of, the opportunity, one of these discussion opportunities. Because I think one of the best things we can do for it is to point this out. And they'll, no, they're noticing it more themselves. I, in, in a sex ed classroom that I was in, uh, where that was co-ed, um, they were talking about something, and one of the boys raised his hands and he said, his hand, and he said, "You know that baseball metaphor that everybody uses to talk about sex? You know that, right? The the rallying basis thing." I never, he said, "I never thought about it before, but baseball has winners and losers. So who's supposed to be the loser in sex?" And I would submit to you, the girls and even the opposing team, they're actually the field on which the game is played. But that moment when he said that was really profound to me. Because it was just a little thing, but it was something that shifted his perspective. And I really believe from now on, he will go into his relationships, again, when they last five minutes or 50 years, more as a partner and less as an adversary who believes he's supposed to see girls' limits as a challenge to overcome. I spent over a year following this um, particular educator around because I really believe in the power of education, because I really believe that young people can and want to work these issues out together in ways that are thoughtful and open-hearted and compassionate. And the communities that, this woman's name is Karis Dennison, she's in um, Marin, and the communities that she served included kids with a, uh, families with a, broad, with a broad range of backgrounds and a broad range of values. And because of that, she didn't talk about good and bad choices or healthy and unhealthy choices, which kind of surprised me. What she talked about instead was saying that her whole job was to help kids make more decisions that end in honor and joy rather than shame and regret. And that worked whether you were you know, a child of, of, in a family that believed in abstinence until marriage or you were a child who felt that it was perfectly appropriate to hook up with another partner, a different partner every weekend. She encouraged her students to replace that baseball metaphor with one that was my favorite, which is popularized by Al Vernacchio, who's a Pennsylvania um, sex educator who likens sex to pizza. So if you think about it, you know, first if you're gonna go have pizza, you, you decide with somebody whether you're gonna have pizza, you talk about it. Maybe you don't want pizza, maybe you want a salad, you know? You, you go out to pizza, you negotiate the toppings. Maybe I like mushrooms and you like pepperoni, and so we go halfsies. Or maybe we get pepperoni this time and mushrooms next time. Or maybe if you keep telling me that you're only gonna have pepperoni, I won't go out to pizza for you, with you anymore, you know? <laughs> and you would never shove pizzas down, down somebody's throat, that would be rude, you know? It, it's all about a shared mutual experience and everybody is invested in the other person's enjoyment. And I think for girls there's an added piece with that where young women are often reluctant to express their opinions or their wants. You know, if, if, if they're with a group of kids and somebody says, which movie do you want to go to? They'll go, you know, whatever one you want to go to. You know, whatever. They'll just, whatever. But you have to say to them, girls, you know, if you don't say what topping you want on your pizza, you're going to end up with green pepper. And nobody <laughs> likes green pepper on your pizza. <laughs> So another way, you know, I mean, I just feel like it's such a great metaphor. You can take it wherever you want to. It's all yours. Um, another way to change the way that we talk about sex is to look at the experience of other countries. And I looked at, in particular, the Dutch. And I was looking at a, 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 I looked at a few different studies, but one in particular that was a survey of 400 randomly chosen um, female college students from two demographically similar universities in Holland and in the U.S. talking about their early sexual experiences. And the Dutch girls embodied everything that we say we want for our daughters. 
They had fewer pregnancies, they had less disease, they had less regret, they were less likely to be drunk when they were engaging, they were um, more likely to be able to communicate their wants, needs, and limits, they said they knew their partner very well, they prepared responsibly, they enjoyed themselves, you know, everything you say went. So what was their secret? They said that their parents, doctors, and teachers all talked to them candidly from an early age about sex, pleasure, and the importance of mutual trust. And what was particularly interesting to me was the American parents weren't necessarily less comfortable talking to their kids about sex, but we framed those conversations entirely in terms of risk and danger. And the Dutch talk about balancing responsibility with joy. And I will tell you, as a parent myself, that really hit me hard, because I absolutely know that if I had not delved into that research, that I would have talked to my own child about contraception, about disease protection, and because I'm a modern mother, I would have talked to her about consent, and I would have thought, job well done. And now I really know that that is not nearly enough. I also know, after talking to so many girls, what I hope for. I want their sexuality to be a source of self-knowledge, creativity, and communication, despite its potential risks. I want them to revel in their body's sensuality without being reduced to it. I want them to be able to ask for what they want from their partners and get it. I want them to be safe from disease, from unwanted pregnancy, from cruelty, dehumanization, and violence. If they are assaulted, I want them to have recourse from their schools, their employers, the courts. It's a lot to ask for, but I don't think it's too much. As parents, teachers, advocates, activists, we have raised a generation of girls who expect egalitarian treatment in the home, in the classroom, in the workplace. Now it's time to demand that intimate justice in their personal lives as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> listening to you tonight, uh, my head spins as a parent. <laughs> Do you feel the same? So um, I think a big question for parents um, listening to you very moving and I'm stirred and I also said because I get it, I get the problem and I get the urgency and how, <laughs> how do I address it with my, yeah. my daughter and my son and how do I talk to them okay. and in particular you bring up the statistics about the average age being 11 years old um, where children get exposed to pornography and you have a statistic in the book about 40%, I think you said, between 10 and 14 will be exposed to pornography. So my first question really is, um, when is it time to talk to our child? When is it too long to talk to them? When do we start having these kind of conversations? Well, you know, I think there's certain kinds of conversations that you start from the get-go, which is the naming of the body parts, which is having, you know, we tend to silo sexuality over here, like it's different than everything else. And in so many ways, it's not. In so many ways, just like bullying, just like all of the other things we're teaching our children about respect and friendship and compassion and human interaction, um, it's an extension. You know, consent, you learn consent when you learn when you're a child, you know, if Johnny doesn't want you to hug him, stop hugging him. You know, if you don't want to do that, the other person needs to stop doing that. We teach our kids those lessons. Mm -hmm. And then we don't make the bridge to teach them of, um, those lessons about sexuality. So there's lessons that are, or, you know, honestly, anybody who has a preschooler knows that they masturbate all the time, you know? And, and so saying, boy, it really feels good when you put your over, it really feels good when you put your pants, but you don't do it at Graham's Christmas dinner table, you know, that's something that we do privately, you know, um, is a way to, you know, to, to reinforce, but also to, you know, give a little sense of propriety there. Um, there's some really great resources for, for people of different ages that, because I know there's, there's such an age range that if I say something that's for people with four-year-olds, it doesn't help the 14-year-old, doesn't help the 18-year-old. So I'm just gonna do a sort of quick 
kit or several books and websites and such that, I, that if, if you're interested, um, I think are really great resources for families. Um, for little ones, um, there's a book called From Diapers to Dating that is, and I, I think actually she has a book for older kids too that I haven't seen yet. Um, the woman who wrote it is a Unitarian minister because the Unitarians honestly have the best sex ed. They have the Our Whole Lives program. Um, if any of you happen to be a Unitarian or, or are you know, leaning that way, it's, it's, it's a reason to be a Unitarian. Um, and uh, so, so she, she, her, that book um, places talking about sexuality and bodies and um, respect in a developmental context that's appropriate for small children up through puberty. And, um, and it's fascinating not only, it's a fascinating read not only for its information on sex, but just for its information on developmental psychology of kids. It's really interesting. Uh, and for the kids themselves, there's a series of books called, well, there's Sex is a Funny Word, and then there's a series of books by Roby Harris, um, R-O-B-I-E Harris. Uh, there's one, there's, it's not, it's so amazing, it's not the stork, um, and it's perfectly normal, I think, are the three main ones, and they're for different, age, they say, if you look them up on Amazon or at your local bookstore, they say what age group they're for, um, and they go through, I actually think they're great to have around indefinitely, but they certainly go through middle school um, and cover all the basics in a really uh, open and unbiased and non-salacious way. Um, for parents of older kids and of younger kids, Deborah Rothman's book, Talk to Me First, is a really great guide to becoming the askable parent, the parent that your child and possibly other people's children too will come to talk to. Um, for, for high school and college students, I suggest Heather Karina's book, SEX, a Progressive All You Need Guide to Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's all you need to figure that out from there if you Google it. Um, and her website, the website she founded, which is called Scarlet Team, um, is a very medically accurate, like if, if your kid is prone, if they're going to be Googling, like what's a blowjob, or if they're going to be Googling all this stuff, they might as well be doing it in a site where you know they're going to be getting accurate, non-salacious, egalitarian, humane information, and that's this site. So it's a resource that you can give your high schooler and say, you know, in case you're, you're threatening to go to Dr. Google on this, um, this, this is the place to go. So those are, those are and, and Albert Accio, the pizza guy, wrote a book called For Goodness Sex, which is also an excellent resource. And I think if you look at those books, I mean, we read so many books about raising our kids, and we tend not to be very prepared on this count. And you really have to kind of get ahead of it so that when that time comes, you've already got your whole wrap down and you don't get caught out and freaked out. Um, the other thing for, for people with older kids is I found what a lot of people have told me is I did, I've done a lot of interviews around this book and I did a pod, I did um, Terry Gross's show, Fresh Air. Um, and uh, which is on my website under the news button. And you, or you can get it online, whatever, on, on, on iTunes or whatever. Uh, but you can just happen to be listening to it in the car. <laughs> and people have told me about this. And then you can say, you know, Jesus, you know, it's interesting what she's saying. Um, is that what's going, you know, did, did you find that this is true among your friends? So in, in the world that you're in, so then you're not actually talking about them, yeah. you know? It's, it's putting it more of a, in the so it's a kind of ways to find, ways to kind of um, circumvent that, and get around that boundary of embarrassment that Americans have. And I just want to say one other thing about the Dutch while, while I'm yelling here, which is um, one, another thing that really struck me in looking at that research and, and kind of hit me in the gut as a parent was that Amy Shallot, who wrote this book called Not Under My Roof, compared the American and the Dutch attitudes towards sex and history of their attitudes towards teenage sex. And she talked about how Americans presume that our teenagers will grow into adulthood by creating a rift with us. 
and we almost force them by not discussing these subjects to become two people, particularly girls, to be the good girl at home and then be the person that they are in the world. And the Dutch have this word, which I don't know if you are Dutch because I cannot pronounce this, but it's something like Gesellheit. <laughs> No. <laughs> it means cozy togetherness. Is that so? Anyway, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It means cozy togetherness. And it's the idea that it's a very interdependent way of raising kids that there's a presumption that you talk about all these issues within the family context and that they're normalized and you're, you know, you just bring, you know, or they, they just talk about sex with their kids all the time. And the idea is that the kids grow up, you know, within the family and confiding in the family and developing and, and talking and discussing in the family. There's, you know, when I read that, I sort of thought, well, I don't want my child to be growing up like dating a with me and lying to me. I want her to be able to talk to me, even if it's, you know, making me as wildly as embarrassed as shit it's making her. Um, but once, you start, like I said, I can't say my daughter always enjoys it, but we've broken heads. I mean, I, did, I wrote a book, that's how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's really the core of it. How do we make those, how do we have those conversations? How yeah. do we bridge those kind of gaps? And how do we work with our own embarrassment or our yeah. own barriers? And to those another kind of thing is, if you can't, find somebody who can. You know, I mean, I, I've been that person, I, um, I had a niece who, when she was 16, um, was having, had had a, was with her boyfriend for about a year, I'd say, something like that, and uh, my sister-in-law thought she was thinking about having an person. She didn't feel like her daughter would talk to her about it, so she asked if I would take her out. This was before I'd written this book or anything, so I was really not comfortable. Um, but I said yes, and you know, over Chinese food, I'm sitting thinking, would the floor please open and swallow? Um, and, and, you know, I talk, I said, look, I, I know that you're thinking about this, and I just want to ask you some questions, I don't have to answer them, but I'm um, just curious, like, you know, have you ever masturbated? Have you had an orgasm on your own? Have you had one with your partner? I mean, I know they have a very nice, emotionally close relationship. And if you haven't, if, the, if you say no to these things, and if you can't talk to him about these issues, why, are you, why do you want to do this? What, what are you hoping to gain? What, are you, what, what is the purpose of this for you? And she didn't really say anything at the time. She just sat there with her eyes like this big. <laughs> I'm still thinking, oh God, oh God, please swallow me. Please lightning, please, you know, get me out of here. But we had this conversation and I actually should ask, I haven't talked to her, she's 25 now. I haven't talked to her about that particular conversation, but I feel like that she, she and I are very, very close. And that opened a door for her so that when she had some issues down the line around these areas in college, I was the person that she called. And we still, we talk all the time. We talk about her career, we talk about her sex life, we talk about her sexuality, we talk about you know, her goals in life. And I feel that the reason that that's happened is because I showed up that day. And I showed her that no matter, you know, that I was willing to go to a place that was scary and vulnerable and embarrassing. And she could trust me with that. So I think that creating, it's an opportunity to create a relationship with a young person in your life that can really give you something, not just be embarrassing and you know, make you want to die, but give you something that you will have together for many years. Obviously your book focuses so much on girls, so it begins the question, what about the boys? So how do we talk to our boys? How okay. do we have to talk to One of the issues that I, I think about yeah. mothers or boys, I mean, Two boys, so it's like uh, they're not exactly the most talkative, yeah. especially in the puberty years and um, you know, embarrassment and all that business. But how how do we well, how do we reach them? How so do we have that conversation? I can't. I don't have good answers for that mm -hmm. not right now. But my I'm starting now with open boys. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to bring me back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll be able to answer those questions really well. Oh. So I, you're going to have to give me some time on that. But I'll get there. Okay. I promise you I'll get there. But you did say earlier that in your conversations even today that the, the, boys, the kids and also the boys were very open to having those kind of things. They were, yeah. yeah it was my to the kids today, the boys were, were very interested. Um, and the girls and boys were talking 
across to one another as well in ways that I can't tell you what they were talking about because we promised we wouldn't talk about the Vegas rules, but um, but they were talking across to one another as well, and that was really interesting to see in really open-hearted ways and in, in really thoughtful ways with no recrimination or accusation or anything like that, but just like really trying to understand. Um, and, and I do believe that that, and that is why I ended the book in a co-educational classroom. Because I felt, and, and I mean the funny thing was, for me, you know, I'll tell you anyway, I had no, I had no intention of writing about boys. I, I sort of had a little bit of a mental block. I thought, I didn't think I could, you know, I was afraid. I it was out of my comfort zone and all of that. And, and I finished the book and um, it came out and immediately people started saying to me, are you going to write about boys? Are you going to write about boys? Are you going to say, no, that's really somebody else's task, I think. I, it's not my thing. And, and over time, you know, since the book has come out, I thought, you know what? I actually have a lot to say about this. I really do want to do this. And then I look back at the book, because you finish a book a year before, you, before it comes out, and I noticed that the last scene in the book is of a boy. And he's going up to Karis, the teacher, and he is talking, he's very tremulous and his, there's tears in his eyes because his girlfriend is pressuring him to have intercourse and he's not ready. But as a guy, he doesn't know how to say that. He, he feels he's not supposed to say that and he's really struggling. And, and I kind of end on her talking to him and with a, you know, what I say is a shout out to parents of boys about how this is important for them too. And some, you know, somehow my little lizard brain, I think, was, was setting me up was telling me, you know, that you're not done here. Because it's really going to seem like that in the whole book. So I, I feel like if it, 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 it was already percolated. So I'm sorry that I can't answer a lot about that. But I will if you're patient. No, but I think uh, the hopeful message is that there is interest. I think there is, and there's really, uh, I think it's a voice to I think it's, it, it can be harder to get them to talk. So what would they do? They're quite vocal. Yeah. What can we as parents, since you were talking about the pervasive culture and also the culture in which we, you know, alcohol and sex, and you have a passage in your book where you talk about the mistakes, and what you would tell your daughter if she made a mistake, um, and um, what can we do as parents um, being around the culture of drinking and book of culture? How, what can we do? Because I think part of what we're all getting to is we feel a little helpless, mm -hmm. right? And, and, a, and a kind of, yes, we understand we need to have as many more conversations mm -hmm. and it's hard to do. And, but what are some, I mean, you said a few things already, but what are some of the ways that we can be almost kind of cultural? Okay? How can we? I think we do have to be mystified. I mean, I think it's really important to say, you know, sex and love is not great. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not just, you know, like what you're doing. In, in drunk sex? That's not very good. Um, I think that the issues of consent now are much more salient than they were a few years ago, and that that may have some impact because kids are trying to work out, like, if somebody's drunk, can they consent, how do they have to be, you know, all of those issues, and I think that that's kind of in play right now and a little frightening. Right. Okay. So I think that that's a sort of fear is kind of now suddenly but introduced. I think, too, 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 you know, that there's nothing wrong with awkwardness. Mm -hmm. Awkwardness is trying to tell you something. It's either trying to tell you, maybe you don't want to be doing this, or it's telling you that you need to be talking about this with the person, or, you know, like the, to try to numb out your awkwardness. Mm -hmm. Kind of a dubious thing to do. So really encouraging the kids to be okay with that kind of awkwardness or discomfort. Yeah, to think about what that means about what they're doing. And, and again, you know, I mean, I think that if you, if you start noticing on TV, um, how often hookups are glamorous. And how often they seem to be really fun, and everybody has a great time. It's not really what it's like. So again, you know, I think high school students, particularly, well, no, any high school, I, I would say high school students are old enough to read books like this. And, and I find that the chapter on hookups, um, I get a lot of feedback from kids on that. And it's from girls, particularly, but from boys too sometimes. And it's grateful that it's sort of said what they've been thinking about for, well, for whatever reason, they don't say to one another. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, this kind of sucks. I'm not really having a good time. Yeah. They don't want to say, you know, it's like the empty has no clothes. They don't want to say it. And then maybe if enough of them can say that and admit that and talk to them about it, they can shift the culture. Yeah, so come.
conversation. Yeah, it just know. hasn't been fostered. You know, it hasn't been disrupted for that. And I'm aware that we're kind of at the end of the mm -hmm. evening, so maybe also something about what do we as parents do with this topic? Our own discomfort, our own awkwardness. Get over it. Seriously, that, I mean, you don't have to pick and choose. Yeah. You know, you got to get And I, I, always, I sort of say that there's the face behind your face, right? So you have this face on your face, like you're, you know, like you're totally cool with it. Totally understand, and gee, that's really an interesting question. What do you think about that? Meanwhile, behind that face, you're going, ah, it's totally okay. Everybody's like that, you know. It's okay to feel, you know, grossly like you just want to like writhe on the floor. Just do it anyway. Just do it anyway. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.